Sir, thanks for being here. There, there are some people, I, I've seen it posited, that, uh, that the Fed, if it were to blink or pause, it's not going to be because of, of economic conditions, but because of something, I don't know, scary, something similar that we saw uh, yesterday, uh, maybe some type of dislocation. I wonder, how, how, do, you, how do you try to an anticipate that? The, the piece in the journal today says we're fortunate to have King Dollar so that we don't have the same type of, um, you know, it, it was easier for that to happen over in the UK and it won't happen here. But we've got our own issues uh, with, with debt ratios and, and everything else, with, with some of the stuff we're seeing from the Biden administration. Do you know for sure that there's not something under the surface if you continue to raise rates sharply that would cause you to pause because well, you... Of, of disorderly market conditions or pensions or whatever, whatever you, you want to use. Yeah, I mean, Joe, you're right that no one knows for sure. And what we saw at the beginning of the pandemic, of course, was dysfunction in that all important treasury market. You know, there have been steps to try to make that a more robust market and a more resilient market. Um, so no one knows for sure. So far, we haven't seen the kind of market dysfunction, even through what's happening in the global markets right now. We haven't seen that in the U.S. markets. But we've got to always be attuned to the possibility and be able to react appropriately should something like that happen. And that's, you know, that's how we're balancing sort of what we need to do on the monetary policy side, knowing that market dysfunction is not helpful for us to achieve our monetary policy goals. So I take your point that we need to be cognizant of that. But right now, I don't see that. Um, in the market functioning that we're looking at. I, I use so many expressions, sometimes I, I get tired myself, but this is, this is not your, your father's labor market either. And I'm now switching to economic numbers that, that, that are coming in and whether we can trust those to give us an accurate picture. If there are parts of, of the economy where inflation really is moderating, but we have this new hybrid workforce and we have a you know, low participation rate and we've got you know, new ideas about, about how, to, how we actually want to approach uh, labor. What if, that's where, what if that's why we have this inflation, but it's, not, it's moderating everywhere else and you stay to, you, know, you kill the patient when it didn't need to be killed because you were misinterpreting what the labor market's telling us. So all the indicators we have from businesses that we talk to is that the labor market demand is still outpacing supply. The firms we talk to in manufacturing and the service sector still are trying to hire and they're still trying to find labor force. I think the things you're talking about are important when you're thinking about will labor force participation, you know, move up from levels where they currently are. And I take the fact that, you know, we're basically back to trend on the labor force participation rate given demographics. So I'm not expecting this big influx of workers. I think we'll get some relief there. I think some people will be drawn back in, but I'm not expecting that. So then we have to ask, okay, we've got to moderate, right, the, both the labor market and product markets if we're going to get inflation back down. At some point, once we get real rates up and we see more of that moderation demand, you're exactly right. Then, you know, there's some trade-offs, and then you need to be concerned, you know, have you gone too far, or, you know, is this a good place to stop? We're not at that point yet. Inflation is still at a 40-year high. So right now, the, the, the conversation has to be, we have to do what we ha must do to get back to price stability, because we can't have a healthy economy, we can't have good labor markets over time unless we get back to price stability. I mean let me follow up on that, which is you, you've done three 75 basis point rate hikes in a row, um, which is historic by itself. Um, they say that monetary policy acts with long and variable lag. So you have no idea when what you've done to the economy is going to hit. Given the rapid rise in rates, why isn't there an argument for a pause sometime, even if you're still going higher, to see what kind of effects you've had on the economy. Yeah. yeah, we can have that conversation, but we're still not even in restricted territory on the funds rate. So you're right, we've moved the funds rate up 300 basis points this year, but look how high inflation is. So, you know, it has well, to give be Give me relative. the number. What's, when you say, you know, four and a half, right. what's restrictive about four and a half? How much, how, what inflation number are you using? Right. To so if in inflation there? moves is at three and a half next year, right, or even lower, which is what, you know, the median CPI 
or right. the, T, the SEC, SEC says, right, then that would be a, a positive that real rate. Right. You'd have so, to get to four and a half right, over one percent positive rate. The other thing to, to understand, though, <clears> as inflation comes down, right, even holding the funds rate at a particular level is a more restrictive policy. So that's going to be the calibration exercise.